I love the, the, the track and field stat. I just heard this the other day, that the one mile, there's, there's, two, there's, there's two events that, that are the same distance, the one mile and the four-person uh, relay. They're, they're, they're one mile, uh, but the difference is, is you got fresh legs and you got more energy when you have four people than just one person. And so the record for the one mile is uh, three, three minutes and 45 seconds, but the four-man relay is two minutes and 54 seconds. We can go further, we can do more together than alone. That's pretty cool, huh? I like that. Now, you can tell I'm a runner. I'm just kidding. Uh, you can, <laughs> we can... We can go further, faster if we're together. And there's things and breakthroughs that happen only in groups. And so you're probably saying, hey, there's a group inside of me. There's, there's a passion. I read a book. I went, I, there's a curriculum. There's something that my, my wife and I, we, we experience breakthrough in our marriage through this, we would love, of course, we're gonna vet all the curriculum. We wanna hear about it. It's, it's gotta be Bible-centered, Christ-centered. Uh, but we'd love to hear what's on your heart because the real miracle is out here. The miracle's in you. The gifts and talents are in you. And so those things are living in you and they don't belong just dormant inside of you. We wanna help. This church wants to help you kind of, kind of exhume that and then share it with this community, and even those outside of the community. I want you to think about this, that there are thousands and thousands of parts to an airplane, and none of them are able to fly. Not one of those parts individually can fly. But when they're together, what happens? You can put 170,000 pounds in that airplane and travel across the United States at 40,000 feet at 600 miles an hour when it's connected. And all of us together is better than any one of us alone. Can I get an amen from the church this morning? All right. So July 24th, July 24th. Okay, so we're gonna be going to Mark chapter eight and 15. Mark chapter eight and 15. And I'm sure some of you've heard about what's happened in Miami, uh, the condo that fell, Champlain Towers, South Tower. Have you, have you followed this? This tragedy, uh, 86 people confirmed dead. I think 43, 44 uh, missing, which essentially at this point feels like they're dead. They're gone. We're going to keep moving the rubble away. And the saddest part about this story are the warnings, the warnings, the warnings that were, were told in 2018, the warnings of, hey, the, the concrete that are, is cracking. And, and engineers come out and say, warning, we've got to do something. We've got we to wake up. We've got to pay attention to this because if we don't pay attention to this, there could be a catastrophe. And so today I want to just share with you one verse but it is a warning to you and I to, to you and I as followers of Jesus. So how many want to heed the warnings that Jesus gives? How many want to pay attention to what Jesus is trying to teach us and help us in our spiritual formation? So Mark chapter 8 and 15 says this. He cautioned them saying, "Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Beware, watch out. There's a leaven. For a lot of us, it's like, what is leaven? Leaven is essentially, let's just say yeast. There's, there's, a, there's a leaven. There's a yeast that gets into the dough. Today, I'm going to be your doughologist, okay? It gets in the dough. It gets in the clump. And all of a sudden, it begins to change the chemistry and the, and, and the, and, and the way that this this dough reacts is going to be changed by this leaven. And there's a watch out warning for these two kind of leavens that exist. And as I begin to describe these in a little bit, you are going to probably see that these exist and you're going to go, oh yes, I've seen that before. I've, I have felt that before or I have struggled with that before or I've, I've felt the temptation to go that way before. And today my message is simply going to be called double trouble because these, these are like the antithesis of each other. These are two things and two, two ways that, that Christians go. And I think that Jesus wants us to walk his path, follow his nature, to seek after his passion and purposes. And there is a warning that there is a ditch on either side of this path called following Jesus. Can I get an amen? And here's what C.S. Lewis said. He said, 
The enemy always comes in twos, and he will get us to hate one so we fall in love with the other. We hate one so we fall in love with the other. So the, the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. That's what we're going to talk about today. Heavenly Father, we open our hearts. We ask that the living word would teach the written word. I thank you for the gospel that has saved our souls, the message of hope through Jesus, that the debt that we owed that we could not pay, that Christ came and paid a debt he did not owe, and that truth sets us free. That truth makes us whole. That truth begins us in the greatest journey of following Jesus knowing him fully. We honor you today, Lord, in your word, in your truth, in Jesus' name. And everybody say, amen. amen. <clears throat> there is a nature inside of us that gravitates to extremes. It's just how we're built. And you can see it in the political world. You can see this polarization and extreme mindset because it's it feels good to have an enemy. It feels good to demonize. It feels good to, to out, of, out of hate or uh, some kind of spiritual ambition, feel like we're fighting a certain thing. And, and, and let, me, let, me, let me give you a couple of examples of how this works. Paul is in Malta. He gets bit by a viper. He's got a snake hanging off of his hand. It's one of my goals to never be bit by a snake. Can I get an amen? I don't want to be eaten by a bear. I don't want to be bit by a snake. I don't want to be attacked by a shark. It's not a big list. It's just a list that exists. <laughs> snake bite in the hand, and they look at him while the, the venom is going into him, and they go, this man is a sinner, and he's a, the gods are angry at him. He's the worst. You're the worst. This is, this is, this is providence. Something, you did something wrong. He shakes the snake into the fire. They're waiting. They're, they got the watch going. The countdown, nothing happens. They go, this man's a God. This man is deity. They go from he's the worst sinner to he's deity. This is human nature. You're the worst of, you are the best. You are, you're the worst. You're the best. Or Zacchaeus, remember Zacchaeus, the little guy who climbs the sycamore tree? He, Jesus goes, hey, I'm going to your house today. And, 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 the, and the town's like, he, this is a tax collector. This is, this, is, this is a sinner. He's the worst. And then Zacchaeus comes down and goes, hey, I, I don't hurt people. I don't, I don't take advantage of people. He's, he's, telling, he's telling Jesus how good he is. The town is talk, talking about how bad he is, Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is overestimating his own goodness. And the town is underestimating God's goodness. And this is what we do. This is how extreme we live. We live in the extremes. It's easy to do that. And so what, we're, what Christ is calling us to is wisdom, to walk in wisdom. Because wisdom is different than knowledge. Knowledge is something that puffs up. Knowledge is something that makes you an arrogant Christian. But wisdom gives you the tools to be able to know how to, to walk in this life and to, to walk with others in this life and to, how to be introspective and how to see yourself for who and what you really are through the word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? That's why we need to ask for wisdom, ask for wisdom, because knowledge says a tomato is a fruit, but wisdom says it doesn't belong in a fruit salad. <laughs> you need wisdom, all right? And this is the kind of wisdom that changes us. Now, this leaven, and I don't want to go into breadology and... I, I, I'm a person who enjoys bread. I, we have a motto at our home that bread makes you spread, so be careful. But when we, this, the simple idea is that, that this dough, when you add the yeast or you add the leaven, it's going to expand, it's going to rise, it's going to change, it's going to slowly move through the dough and change its chemical composition. And this is the warning that as a believer, you can catch something and it can begin to change you. You can have the wrong conversation at the right time and you can get some of the leaven of the Herod on you or the leaven of the Pharisees on you. And when you get it on you, it starts to get in you. 
It starts to change the way that you think and the way that you deal with people and the way that you look at people and the way that you respond to God's word and to, to God's church. And all of a sudden, you, we go, how did you go from here to there? I used to know them when they were, and now there's an heir. And, and, and both of these leavens, if you have your spiritual spider senses, it's that leaven that you go, I don't know what it is about them. There's something there that's kind of off-putting. There's, a, there's an arrogance. There's a pride. There's a, there's a thing. And I'm gonna, uh, we'll unpack what those are in a minute. But it's something that I think we're all aware of, but sometimes not aware that it can exist inside of us. Are, you, are we good? It's a nine o'clock service. I know it's early. This is the first test run, okay? We'll dial it in for the next one. <laughs> Michael Corleone, Godfather. Didn't see Godfather until two years ago. Someone said, you haven't seen Godfather. I said, I haven't seen Godfather. They're like, you've got to go see Godfather. And, and, and what I appreciate about the movie more than anything was the transition this, that you can see. You can see the development. You can see the unwinding of this person. And it doesn't happen overnight. It's moment by moments. It's transition. And this happens. And it can happen to you. And you can say, it will never happen to me. And it can happen to you. So today's just... I'm going to amplify the warning that Jesus gave us. Amen. And nobody called me and nobody's wife or husband called and said, you got to touch on this. I'm just teaching the word here. So let's start with the leaven of Herod. What is the leaven of Herod? Well, to understand Herod, you got to go back in time and remember that Herod was this opulent personality who was trying to relive the, the days of Solomon. He was a builder. He was a man who loved entertainment. Not so much the word of God, not so much the instructions of God. He was a man who lived loose. He was a man who wanted to do what he wanted to do. And it wasn't just in him, Herod the Great, it was in his son and his grandson. The Herods were people who their heart, their ambition was not to please the Lord. Their heart and ambition, if you will, the nature of Herod, if we were to quantify it, is the desire for pleasure, the desire for fun. We call it, and there's a big word, hedonism. Hedonism. Will you just say that with me? Hedonism. 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 All right? Now, it's not just a man thing. It's herdonism, too. It can be herdonism or hedonism. Sorry, that was a terrible joke. That wasn't even in my notes. Sorry. And essentially, the leaven of Herod is this. His morality dictated his theology. Not his theology dictating his morality. He shaped the way he thought about God and thought about the world based on his own desires for pleasure, enjoyment, comfort, and entertainment. So much so that when a damsel danced for him, he said, whatever you want. She says, I want John the Baptist's head. He kept his oath. He killed John the Baptist because he loved entertainment. He wanted to be entertained. Life was about experiencing your greatest experience, your greatest truth, be you. There's no restraints. There's, there's nobody who can tell you what to do. You let, and we'll, we'll figure out theology, how to bend it into our experience. We'll get our morality based on our feelings, based on our preference, and then we'll get our theology to bend. We'll put it in an arm bar and bend it to how we want to live. Now, maybe you're going, that, that's not me. Or maybe you're going, hey, I've done that before. So we say this. I'm looking to God's word for my preferred future of how he wants me to live. And how he wants me to be in relationships. And how he wants me to deal with people. And how he wants me to talk. That's good, Pastor. Yes, you're right. It is. I'm looking to the Word. I'm not looking to something subjective 
on how I feel about it because Herod got offended by the word of God. John the Baptist is going, you can't live like that, can't live like that, can't live like that. The conscience that God sends to Israel, Herod locks up in a prison. And this is what the spirit of Herod wants, is we just want, we we don't want that voice to get too loud. Don't do that, shouldn't act like that, shouldn't talk like that. And all of a sudden, we incarcerate the very thing that's the gift that God gave us consciousness that connects with the word of God that aligns and brings a witness to wit- the two or three witnesses of the word and the spirit and, and the conscience that God gave that's connected to that, that conscience. And all of a sudden now that consciousness, that soul is made alive this, through the spirit. When we're born again, all of a sudden we're made alive to God's word. Now it's the bearing witness. You read the word and you go, oh my goodness. And your spirit goes, whoo, just leaps like John the Baptist in, in his mother's belly, Elizabeth's belly. And there's a confirmation in your spirit. And now this becomes the living truth inside of you. Not based on your experiences, not based on what's cool, not based on what is happening on social media. And there's a lot of people who are trying to will their Christianity to fit into a culture that is literally bound by the spirit of Herod that says, I don't mind the God part as long as it's subject to how I feel, what I want, my truth, entertainment. And this is a problem. And it's Herod. It's the leaven of Herod. And every one of us in this room, on some level, have either entertained it or have have dealt with it, been tempted. And it doesn't have to be something extreme. It doesn't have to be. It can be somewhere in in your human spirit fighting, trying to deal with this leaven. Romans chapter eight and six says this, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind, this is the fleshly part of you. This is the part of you that has no connection with God. This is just the the molecules, the part that's connected to this, this world is enmity against God for it's not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We're making spiritual decisions out of the carnal mind. And this produces a carnal Christianity. It's loose. I love the quote, when enough is not enough, hedonism is born. I want more. I want more. I don't, I want more. I don't want my mind to try to justify and come up with loopholes in God's word to accommodate my human carnal desires. My carnal man will always fight the truth of God. We, oh, we good? Let me, let, me, let me show you a guy. His name is Demas. Philemon 1 and 23 says this. I'm gonna say these names wrong. Some of you are gonna be afterwards texting me and saying it's pronounced like this. I know it's wrong, so just, I'm guessing here. Apophis, sounds right. My fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus greets you as Mark, Aristocrus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. These are fellow workers, Demas, Demas. This is 61 AD, Demas. These are, felt we're working together. Colossians 4 and 14 says this. This is 62 AD. This is while Paul is in a Roman prison. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings, also Demas. So while Paul is now in prison, he's been, in, he's been put in prison in Rome, Demas is serving. He's serving the church in Rome. He's serving Paul. He, he's this in-between guy. He's ministering and serving. And then in 66 AD, I want you to see in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and 10 says this, for Demas because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. He was in, he was serving, and even Demas, who was close to Paul the apostle, something hit his heart and changed him. And if it can happen to him, it can happen to any one of us. There's an old saying, when we start to feel like gods, we start acting like the devil. We want a life without boundaries. 
We want a life without commandments, and it leads to brokenness. There's a story of five kings in the book of Judges who came against the people of God as Joshua was bringing them into the promised land, fighting the people of God, fighting God's plan. They end up having to run, hide in a cave. They found out where they were. They put, put boulders in front of the cave, and now they're in this prison. Finally, these men would not repent. These men would not acquiesce. These men would not surrender. And so they were opened up, they were killed, and they were buried back in the cave. And here's the point. What started out as something, a place of refuge to run to as they're fighting God, turns into a prison. And what becomes the prison becomes a grave. And there's things that we run to, things that our flesh runs to, and if we're not careful, becomes a prison. And you say you're free, and we say we're good, and we say we're all right, and we say we can handle this. Before we know it, that comfort turns into a prison, and that prison turns into our grave. We have to be careful. Amen? John chapter 8 and 34 says this. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. When you are under the power of sin, and again, we've all sinned, we've all fallen short, but when we entertain it and we stay in it, we stay in the house and we decide to, to live there, we're not the master, we're not sons, we're slaves. We're in bondage. Second Timothy, and I, I won't read all of this, but it talks about, we, we don't have to put it up, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase some of it and pull just a few things out, but it talks about, Paul talks about how there'll be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God in the end days. Swayed by all kinds of desires. And what happens is the, the people of God are like, we're like submarines. A little hairline fracture in the hull is okay when we're up top on the water, but when we go deep, when there's pressure, that little compromise can break the entire boat. And there's little things that are revealed in the pressure. And in this last year, there's been a pressure and it's revealed what we're made of, what's in our hearts. Second, Second Peter chapter two and 18 says this, for thy mouth Empty boasting words and by appalling, uh, appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while themselves are slaves to depravity. Come on over here. Come to the, but we, can, we can mix what you want in this whole Bible thing and this whole Jesus thing. And again, it's just 11. It's 11 that exists. It existed back then. It exists today. And he says, beware. Beware. So, you might be struggling with the leaven of Herod. If you seek and celebrate comfort more than convictions, if you fight authority or any voice that opposes your fleshly desire, you excuse sin and try to manage it, you re reimagine God's law to accommodate your desires, or if your theology comes from your truth, your morality. Moving on. The leaven of the Pharisees. Thank you very much. The leaven of the Pharisees. So for all of us that were like, yep, 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 okay. Now we're gonna move to the other side. The other extreme. Because we got double trouble, remember? And what happens is, is you can hate one and you're like, no, this is, ah, I don't like this in the church. I don't like this. And then all of a sudden, you fall in love with the other extreme, which is the leaven of the Pharisees. If the leaven of Herod is you having rights, then the leaven of the Pharisees is being right and looking right. Mary and Joseph taught us very early on that you can find religion and lose Jesus. They did it when Jesus was just a 12-year-old. It's easy to find religion and lose Jesus. Did you know that the first human murder in the Bible was around religion? Did you know that Cain and Abel fought because they, dif they, they differed on how they worshiped? 
Do you, do you realize that Jesus died for sinners, but he was killed by religious people? There is a spirit of the Pharisee that can get on any one of us. And the end is murder. You say, I've never murdered anybody. Yeah, but the Bible says if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. So we got leaven of Herod, leaven of the Pharisees. Here's what the Pharisees did. They made rules for their rules. 613 rules in the Torah. That's, does that seem like a lot to you? I am so thankful that Jesus said, hey, we're gonna boil this down. We're not getting rid of these things. These are the, these are the offspring of the two most important, the Shema. We're gonna go back to what it's original. Love God, love people. Because it's hard to steal from someone if you love God, love people. Right? And, and, and we want the law, don't murder. We can go, I haven't murdered. Yeah, but, but you hate that person. So the, the New Testament doesn't, doesn't dial it down, it amplifies it, right? We go, well, I, you know, the Bible says don't commit adultery. And we go, I haven't committed adultery, but, but you have a, an awful marriage. You don't like each other. Grace teaches us how to have an amazing marriage. The law just tells us don't commit adultery. And we're satisfied with that. And here's what the, here's what the Pharisees would do. They would, they would basically have a rule. Don't work on the Sabbath, and they would create a rule to make sure, okay, but we have to go places. So, okay, we can only go this far. And we can only, what should we make it? Let's make it a Sabbath mile. Okay, let's do that. That sounds right. I mean, really, you shouldn't have to travel much further than this. And so they determine and they go, well, if you travel that far, then you shouldn't be carrying this and this. And so well, you, what, what we'll do is we'll put containers of water along the way and, and, and rules and rules and rules. And they would celebrate these little rules that they made up because these were just as important or more important than you just resting, yeah. just having a, good, having a good Shabbat, having a good Saturday. And so what was intended was man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. It was made for you and me. But they would build. We were in Israel. I've been to Israel twice. Amazing experiences. You go there, and on Shabbat, you can't push the button on the elevator. So the elevator just goes to every, on, on Shabbat, starting Friday when the sun goes down till uh, Saturday evening when the sun goes down. That's your Shabbat. You cannot push the button. You get in, it opens up on your floor, and it just goes up, and it goes down each floor because they don't want you to work. And I'm sitting there going, I was on the second floor wanting to go to the first floor, and now I have to go all the way to the top and come all the way down. This is more work <laughs> than just going, Burp. I'm like, what happens if I just hit it with my, my hip? And so now we're, we're working on like, Loopholes. Well, you can, but you can't if you're pregnant. And, and this is the whole modus operandi. And this is why Jesus was like, you strain the gnat. You have turned what is supposed to be bliss and wonder into work. And, you know, it's trying instead of trusting. It's, it's striving. And, and, and the whole gospel is not working for something, it's working from something. We're not working for victory, we're working from victory that we've already received in Christ. That's the whole message. And so what happens with the Pharisee is we start looking and going, well, I mean, it, it's like, well, if we have drums in church, it could lead to dancing, and dancing could lead to fornication. And so we don't wanna have drums in church, right? If we have this in church, if we do this, and if you, if, you, if you go there, then that could lead to that, that could lead to that, that could lead to that. So by not going there, you are worshiping and serving God. And all of a sudden, we've lost the spirit of what this is all about. It was never about a policy. It was about the person of Jesus. It was about knowing him. And instead, we've decided to study rules instead of knowing him. It's like my son who, you know, comes down. This is, it didn't really happen, but I go, hey, son, I'd like for you to clean your room. He goes upstairs. He comes back 30 minutes later. Hey, dad, you can be so proud of me. I went on Google and, and learned 50 different ways to clean my room. 
that's cool. Can you go and clean your room? Goes back up, comes back down. Hey, Dad, I've learned the word clean in Greek, Latin, German, French. Are you proud? Like, yeah, but I'm just asking for your room to not smell like a cheese burrito. Can we get to that point? What is that? How do we get there? Teenage son. Cheese burritos everywhere. Don't know where they're coming from. 7-Eleven, I think. Um, But the rule, the rule is not the thing. The relationship is the thing. Mark 7 and 13 says this, thus you nullify the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down and you do many things like this. You've you've made the word of God of no effect. You're oblivious to what God is doing right in this moment. Jesus, the one, the Messiah that they prayed for, Yeshua HaMashiach, bring the Messiah a savior. He's right in front of them and they're fighting him. At one time they try to throw him off a cliff. He has to disappear. He has to literally go invisible, okay? For the people, like you have kids that don't know the Bible but but love like Marvel and superheroes, Jesus goes invisible. He sneaks out because they're going to kill him before his time. Why? Because of things like his disciples didn't wash their hands according to the traditions. 613 laws in the Old Testament And now they've added thousands upon thousands to them to make sure they never violate it. And so the whole celebration is what they don't do. And in the trying of not doing, they miss what this was all about. It was about Jesus. And so how do we, what happens? Well, now religion gets clunky and funky. And if you go to the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem, how many's ever been to Jerusalem? How many's ever been to Israel? I implore you, if you ever get a chance, it's one of the most amazing experiences, and you're gonna learn a lot about your faith, but you're also gonna learn a lot about religion. You go to the Holy Sepulcher, and as you walk in, there's a ladder leaning against a window up on this ledge as you walk in. And what's the ladder there for? Oh, that ladder's been there for about 70 years. There's an argument on whose it is, the Arminians believe it's theirs. The Baptists believe it's theirs. The Catholics, the Orthodox. So it just stays there. No one can agree on it. And it's like a shame that there's this symbol of division where Jesus allegedly rose from the dead. And I think there are things that we have to determine, are we gonna die for? Are we gonna divide for? Are we going to debate over? Or are we gonna decide for? And, and, and this is how I live my life. There are things that I will, I'm willing to die for. You put a gun to my head, do you believe that Jesus is the son of living God? He died and rose again, yes. Do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Yes. Do you believe Jesus is coming back again? Yes. But then there's things you divide for. Hey, Protestantism, Catholicism, I just, I don't know how to do this whole Pope thing and he's the word and, and the traditions of the Father. I'm divi- I'm, I, I can't do that. I'm not gonna take a bullet. I'm not gonna die. I'm not gonna shoot you. Don't shoot me. We're dividing over. There's things we'll debate for. We'll, we'll debate. I'll debate you about uh, predestination and how that works and we'll get into some fun discussions and there's some things you gotta decide for. Did Adam have a belly button? Don't know, don't care. You choose, I'll choose, let's go our way. (laughs) But here's what happens. We major on the minors when we start thinking like a Pharisee. Oh, they're, they're, yeah, they're the little, mm, the the thing that they do. Mm. They don't know as well as we do. And all of a sudden, we major on minors and then we minor on the majors, and this is what gets us in trouble. And now we're back to the Sabbath, the stress of rest. We gotta fix everybody. Everyone's gotta know. Everyone's gotta have it this way. Right, 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 right. And so how do you detect it in yourself? The first thing is spiritual pride. It is so deadly. Hear me. This is what came out of Lucifer. I will ascend. I am 
me, 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 the word I, I, I will ascend to the hill of the Lord. I will go above, I will be in that place. He, he was the angel that stood in the presence of God and the glory of God shines through him and it was like nine gems and the heavens would light up like a light show. I've obtained this and look what I've done and why can't I be equal with God? And so I'm superior than all the other angels and superior and spiritual pride made him fall like lightning. And so pride becomes the mantra. But pride is so sneaky, it, it just, it hides in words. It hides in actions. But I can see it. And maybe you can see it in me. And I hope if you do, and I hope if we have, that we can be in relationship deep enough to help one another. The problem with this spirit is usually that spirit isolates because it's so superior it can't hear from anybody else because we know better. And the Bible says now it falls on deaf ears and they can't hear and there's a delusion. There's a delusion in both pits. And there's this, <clears throat> there, there's this tendency in Christianity for both of these extremes and today's message is calling us to the middle, calling us to walk in humility, calling us to be aware of the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees that destroys people. Religion, it's this, religiosity. It's the message that's built with guilt. You haven't done enough, you haven't worked hard enough, you don't know enough. And then we're afraid, so we respond with works. And if we get that far, then we have pride. Relationship says, I believe in his love. I feel hope. I respond in faith. The fruit is charity. Because in it all, I realize it was never me. It was the work of the Spirit in me. He drew me. I didn't decide this. This is his good gift. This is the gift of God that brings salvation. Nothing that I could do or add to. Second. Timothy 3, 5 says this, they will act religious and they will reject the power that could make them godly. Matthew 15 says, they glorify me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, I haven't preached in four weeks and I have nine pages of notes. Thank you. <laughs> Always listen to the front row. Three, three more minutes, four more minutes. Demanding justice, wanting mercy. You ever, this happened to me a few weeks ago. I'm on the freeway, driving down. I don't speed, but I can flirt with that number at the, Somewhere there. And so the lights and the siren goes and police officer pulls up right behind me and I'm like, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And then when he's able, he pulls over and he goes and he gets somebody else. And as he's pulling around me, I'm like, go get them. You go get them. They deserve it. They deserve it. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's easy to want mercy when it's you and it's easy to want justice when it's somebody else. Same thing with my son. When he would play basketball in his league, you know, he would be, he'd get fouled and I'd, I'm, the, I'm the loud dad on the side. He got fouled, come on, he got fouled. Come on, I can't believe it. And then my son would foul somebody and the ref wouldn't see that. And I'd be like, thank you, Jesus, you are so good. <laughs> you blinded his eyes. And it's easy to want mercy when it's yours and justice when it's yours. We have moved into a time, and this is the new study, Ed Stetzer, he said that the new reality in Christianity is this, is that people are picking their Christianity and their church connected to and based off of the news network they watch. Because the new norm is I'd rather be right and I'd rather be around people who believe 
exactly the same thing than to be challenged. Now, take it as you will and for whatever it's worth. A.W. Tozer said this, the most important question is what comes to mind when you think about God? What kind of God do you see? That really is what becomes distorted in both of these leavens. But C.S. Lewis said something, and I think, I think he was right. In response to A.W. Tozer, he said, no, the most important question is, what comes to mind when God thinks about you? That is the billion dollar question. What is missing from a Pharisee is understanding the Father's heart. And this is what Jesus tried to display in Luke chapter 15. There's a brother who has sinned and he's messed up and he's, he's a mess. And then there's a brother who's outside the house going, I've never done that before. You're throwing him a big party. Filet mignons going everywhere, flying around the house, getting served. Why didn't I get that? And this juxtaposed two people that exist in the kingdom. Those who need a lot of mercy and those who need to learn how to give a lot of mercy. And you will always be one of them. Let me finish it with this, if I may. Matthew 5 and 21, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of fire, of hell. First John 4 and 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. I asked myself this question several months ago and I had to, honest, I have to, I had to answer honestly and I'm gonna have you answer it in your own heart. This is not your quiz. This was the quiz I gave myself. Are you ready? Chad, how do you feel about people who wear masks? Masks in the car. Chad, how do you fill up people who don't wear masks? How do you feel about people who are vaccinated? How do you feel about people who aren't vaccinated? How do you feel about people who voted blue, voted red? Now, I know this is hard and you're going, oh, you're so ambiguous right now. You're trying to mess with us. I had to check my heart Because a Pharisee will make a policy more important than people. And Jesus said, you've got to know what love requires. Paul taught us that we are the servants, the servants, the antidote to the spirit of a Pharisee is being a servant. A servant stays low. A Pharisee wants to go high. A servant's unseen. A Pharisee wants to be seen. If you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. There's an antidote to both of these, and it is the law of love. On one side, the law of love says, I don't want to break my father's heart. Not about the law. I don't want to break my father's heart. My heart is to please my father. Not to please myself. And the other with the Pharisee is God's love triumphs. The Bible says that mercy and justice kissed. A sloppy kiss. Somehow in Christ it was brought together that grace and truth can exist together in the tension of Christ. That following Jesus isn't easy 
And being a Pharisee, they want everything squared away. This equals this, this equals this. A, a slap, you get another slap. An eye for an eye. It's got a according to the law. And he says, no, Jesus never dealt with people the same way. Jesus would tiptoe through crowds and find one. Doesn't seem fair. A man who wants to follow Jesus, sell all you have and follow me, rich young ruler. And yet a thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. The Pharisee goes, I need it in a box. I need it to be square. And the power of the grace and truth that is in Christ, that is in us, is complicated and it requires us to depend on the Holy Spirit again and again and again. Beware, beware of these two extremes that are pulling. So we pray, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and this word and I pray that the living word would teach the written word. Let it, let it come alive in our hearts today. Let it, let it be amplified today. Let this teaching and this warning just be a reminder to our heart that the heart that you gave us that cries out for God and wants to please God and wants to know God and realizes that we need grace and we need to give grace. And by what measure we give, we shall be measured back to us. And so God, let us be generous with mercy and generous with grace and generous with those who stumble and generous with those who are without and generous with those, Lord, who don't know the truth but need us to shine a light so they can see the glory, the glory of God through the face of this marvelous mystery called the church. I pray for every person in this room right now that you would inspire our hearts to be able to walk worthy of the vocation by with we are called. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to my heart today. And thank you for opening your heart today. I pray that something was added to your faith and added to your walk with the Lord. I'm going to have our prayer team come forward. Um, at the end of every service, we want to give you an opportunity to receive prayer, to be prayed with, to be prayed for. If you need a miracle in your life, your body, your family, don't be bashful. Let us pray and agree together where two or three are gathered. The Bible says, let, let the elders come forward. Let, let leaders come forward. Let, let, let those come forward that have faith and the prayer of faith will save the sick. So we practice that every week. You may stand. I'm gonna dismiss you in about 20 seconds. Again, just a reminder, second Wednesday is just a few days away. Golf league going great. We're all losing tons of balls, but finding them as we search for the lost balls so that's evening out, zeroing out. Um, ladies, it's gonna be an awesome weekend. A lot of great things. Stay connected, stay plugged in. If you're home, if you're here, do it. If you're, on, if you're going out, please be safe as you drive and you travel as things open up. We continue to pray for Pastor Ross and, and um, others that are in need and some of you know the need some of you don't but um, if you want to ask us we can we can share with you but um, we just want to we just want to see God's goodness uh, to continue to move and shine in Sonoma County so continue to pray with us for revival and hearts turning to God in this county amen God bless you have a wonderful wonderful day